morning, he's doing a new. You are doing a new thing, doing a new thing now. We receive it, Jesus. You are doing a new thing, doing a new thing now. We lean in, we lean in. Oh, you are doing a new thing, doing.
for this. 
even greater, even greater than they stood before, even greater than you stood before. stretching it and I don't know who it's for but it was just like he's waiting on you patiently to just pick up this fruit and just enjoy and he gave me the word eat of my fruit and it's just like I don't know he's just waiting for you to just pick it up and enjoy it and it's not that when you pick up the fruit the fruit like diminishes like it's always going to be a continuous flow of fruit but you have to continually pick it up and eat it and you have to continually enjoy like what he has for you Lord, we sit at your table. We sit at your table this morning. You're doing what only you can do this morning. You are doing what only you can do this morning. in the room that just keeps looking at ruins like a situation and you just look at it like it's a pile of ruins I just hear the heart of God for you to say that you have the favor of the Lord on your life his hand is on your life and he's not removing his hand you have not lost everything is not done away with and over he said he's going to restore the ruins even greater than they stood before you're going to stand even greater than you stood before he is not taking his hand off of you he wants you to know that this morning he is not he is not removing his favor and his hand off of you you have the hand of the lord on you whoever that's for you have the hand of the lord on you so empowered by the Holy Spirit to run and do every single thing that God's called you to do. You have not forfeited anything. He's working out all things for the good of those, all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He's doing this. He is doing this even greater than you stood before. He says even greater than you stood before.
And honor and glory 
it's a new leaf like someone like God's going to be appointing people to higher places from the very thing that they're that they've come from I guess I'm not exactly sure I'm understanding fully but he's just been repetitively telling me that we're in a t- we're in a time of Esther and I kept seeing like a robe and a gold crown just being crowned like we're being crowned in Father. Father, thank you for everything that you are doing among us. Lord, thank you for what that you have released in the atmosphere today. What that you're about to encourage us with, empower us with, bring course correction to us with. God, whatever that you dream for we just say yes to and we thank you God for doing it Lord we say there are are no limitations in you and so father we just invite a deeper measure of the unlimited realm into this room God God I thank you for filling this place with your glory with your glory God you fill the place God, you fill the place so often with your glory. God, we thank you, God, that today, God, you did it again. So, Lord, we just we give you glory, God, for testimonies that will come out of these environments, healings that will come out of these environments, and people that got free in these environments, God. We thank you, Lord, for what that you do in gatherings such as this, God, and that we will increase our expectation that we will increase our expectation, God, that you will go beyond our expectation. You will go beyond our expectation. God, we, we understand that you are a God of miracle signs and wonders, and we want to celebrate that. But Lord, we want to know you. We want to know you, Father. We thank you, God, for your mighty acts. And we will celebrate that, Father. But we want to know you at a greater capacity and degree than we've ever known you, God. As it will become a key to unlocking things in the earth. A deeper measure of knowing you. So, Father, we thank you, God, for just taking us deeper in today. We thank you for taking us deeper in today. Today. Lord, I thank you for curtains being pulled back. I thank you for veils being lifted and curtains being pulled back, God, that people see things that they've never seen before, and they begin. you begin to highlight things, God. I see, I see you doing that, Lord. You just highlight things from a different 
from a different angle. God, you, you shift us and you turn us, God. And then, then, then your highlighter comes and you begin to highlight something from another, from another angle, God, so that we can see it differently than we had seen it before, God. And it's going to, it's going to cause uh, um, answers to come and an, and an increase of wisdom increase of wisdom in situations and circumstance god every situation and circumstance every affliction every addiction is for your glory that you may shine through and through the opportunity god and release the true dream of heaven over everything god and we thank you god for doing that thank you holy spirit amen Amen. To God be the glory. Thanks, worship team. You're ridiculous. Hey, Annie sent me a word. Am I supposed to read this or is this like for me like, okay. Well, I didn't know if you're like, you know, you could have been asking me about something else. I don't know. I was just going to look here. Could have got awkward. While they, while they were singing such a time as this, I see someone dressed in the finest garments and draped with the greatest jewels. Their beauty glows and shines in dark places. I hear the words, you're clothed in the finest garments of God. Stop looking at old garments you once wore. He has the best of the best for you because he is equipping you. He is equipping you. That's good. He's equipping you. Father, I thank you for your equipping. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're going to go to Mark chapter number four. I believe Mark chapter 4, Exodus 14, and I want to start in Galatians 4. Galatians 4. We'll start in verse 1. I really want to grab verse 8 there. Here in just a minute. In a similar way, Galatians 4.1. In a similar way, God has promised our ancestors something better. But as long as an heir is a minor, this, this is familiar. We've, we preached out of this uh, a few months back. So long as an heir is a minor, he's not really much different than a servant, although he's master over all of them. So as so long as an heir is a minor, he's talking about maturity here. So long as the heir is immature, then he's no different than a servant, even though he's master over everything. For until the appointed time by the Father, when he comes of age, when he reaches a degree of maturity, the child is under domestic supervision of the guardians of the estate. So it is with us. When we were juveniles, we were enslaved under the hostile spirits of the world. But when that era came to an end and the fulfillment had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the written law. Yet all of this was so that he would redeem and set free all those held hostage to the written law so that we would receive our freedom and a full legal adoption as his children. This is good. So it is with us. While we were juveniles, we're enslaved under the hostile spirits of the world. So in spiritual immaturity is what you are, what you are enslaved to is a, is a prophetic indicator of the maturity in your life. You don't have to be enslaved to anything. There's a, and, and it's been a few weeks now, but there's a scripture and it lists all this kind of, uh, what it, the, all the immorality. It's like, be free from every sexual immorality, be free from every, um, every vice of the enemy. And then it begins to list like sickness and disease right in the middle of that. 
So right in the right in the middle of the decree of heaven for you to be free from sexual immorality is for you to also be free from disease and sickness. He puts those things in the same in the same category. I, I want to help you. I want to help you right here. So he 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 puts you in this in the same category. But now listen, if you leave here like, well, I, I got sick, so that that's I mean I, I'm classified as the same as a sexual immoral. You're not hearing this correctly. You're not hearing this correctly. Just as he wants to set you free from every vice of the enemy, sickness and disease is also a vice of the enemy. But everything that is on you, everything that has happened to you is for the glory of God. This is what he said about the man that was, that was he was fixing to heal and that he was a man that was born blind. And, the, and they begin to question and they said this question to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And what's a stupid question? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, meaning that he either sinned in his mother's womb or he is living a reincarnated life or the sins of the father are passed down to the son. And Jesus puts an end to the, all of this stupidity. And he said it was neither this man nor his parents that sinned that he was born blind, but this is for the glory of God. Every sickness you encounter is for the glory of God. Every disease you encounter is for the glory of God. Does that mean God gave that to them for his glory? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that he will cause what the enemy intended for evil to be flipped for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. So when you encounter something in life that you do not understand, make up your mind that this situation is for the glory of God. This is for the glory of God. Okay, so when so it is with us when we're juveniles, when we're in our immaturity, we're enslaved under the hostile spirits of the world. And, and for people that think, no, we don't have to be enslaved to any vices as enemy, just that's for when we all get to heaven type, that, that type thinking, he puts an end to that stupidity as well right here. But when that era came to an end, what era? When we had, the era came to an end that we had to be enslaved under to all these hostile spirits of the world. That era came to an end. When did it come to an end? It came to an end at the fulfillment, when the, when, but when that era came to an end and the fulfillment had come, what was that fulfillment? God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the written law. When Jesus came, the era shifted from you having to be enslaved and being the whipping boy of hell anymore to making up your mind that you truly are an overcomer. And the more you get that revelation of what God is wanting you to overcome, the more you'll see everything as an opportunity for God's glory to shine through when it came to an end when did it come to an end when he sent his son so that came to an end when he sent his son even in the last words of his earthly ministry he cried out it is finished it is finished it is finished was not just the work on the cross it was the announcement that a new era and a new day had begun. A new era and a new day had begun. You're no longer enslaved to all this stuff. Why, does, why is it important that we're not all, all enslaved to all this stuff? Yet all this, verse 5, yet all this was for what? So that, we would, so that he would redeem and set free all those held hostage to the written law so that we could receive our freedom and full legal adoption as his children. Now this is identity. He did all of this to bring an identity of you being children of God, of us being sons of God. Sons and daughters. Verse 6. And so that we would know for sure that we are true children, God released the spirit of sonship into our hearts, moving us to cry out intimately, My Father, you are our true Father. Now we're no longer living like slaves under the law, but we enjoy being God's very own sons and daughters. And because we're His, we can access everything our Father has. Remember, he started out talking about when an heir is a minor. He's, when an heir is a minor, he's no different than a slave. He's no different than a servant. He's not talking about just the age of a minor. He's talking about the maturity of a minor. 
The scripture says in Romans 8, them that are led by God are the sons of God. As we've pointed out so many times like this before, if we go read that, it says the mature sons of God, depending on your translation, but what the, what the, the Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek coming together, it's saying this, that the true sons of God are the ones that are impulses, the mature sons of God. That's why they asked this question, who is eldest in the kingdom? They weren't asking which one is older. Why did they need to know the answer of who's older? We could have just asked for your age and got that question, but they wanted to know who is older because they wanted to know who is the most mature. Because elder is not the oldest, it is the maturity. That's why, that's why you can be 20 years old and be an elder in a church. Can I help you right here? Because eldership is not in relation to the color of your hair. Eldership is not in relation to how many birthdays that you had. Eldership is in relation to how mature that you became in the spirit. Are you following me? Here it is. For as we are heirs of God... We are heirs of God. Verse 7, let me hit that again. Now we're no longer living like slaves under the law, but we enjoy being God's very own sons and daughters. And because we're his, we can, because we are his, we can access everything our father has, for we are heirs of God through Jesus the Messiah. Why, oh God, let us get this revelation. Because we are heirs of his, we can access everything he has. Well, what does he have? It all belongs to you. And the degree of revelation that you let this run wild in your heart will determine the degree of access that you leverage from the heavens into the earth. And grabbing a hold of this and laying a hold of this and saying that I'm going to, the scripture says, it, it, it talks in like a WWE terms and, 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 and it says it says it like this. I believe it's, what was it Roman? That's Hebrews, Hebrews. He says, he said, we must hold fast the profession of our faith. So when God speaks something to me, there's this process of time for this thing to grow in me. And the more I let that grow in me, the more I can latch onto it like a leech and hold fast. It's like, it's like, it's, it's a term that means like to smack it down and lay, like I'm gonna seize it, smack it. I'm gonna pin that thing to the mat and I'm not gonna, this is, this is the wrestling match of Jacob where he's not letting go until the thing he's holding on to begins to shift in him. I'm going to hold fast the profession of my faith without wavering. That what God said, he's faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. So I have access, I have legal access to everything that my heavenly father owns. Man, we got to get this. Well, Josh, I'm not walking in that yet. You're growing into it. You're empowered into it. It's the pro Listen, God does things instantaneously and in a moment, but it was a process of time to get to your instantaneous X marks the spot. Joseph went to bed one night in prison. He went to bed the next night in the palace, but it took him half of his life to get to that moment. But when God does it, it's done. When God says it, it's as good as done, but you're walking out and letting that seed grow in your heart. You're walking out what God said. All right, for the third time, which will be completion, 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 I'll read verse seven. Now we're no longer living like slaves in the law, but we enjoy being God's very own sons and daughters. And because we're his, we can access everything our father has. God, let that, let that come so alive in us. For we are heirs of God through Jesus the Messiah. We're heirs of him, uh, of God through Jesus. Now this is what I was actually wanting is verses eight and nine. Okay, so here it is. Before we knew God as our father and we became his children before that, we were unwitting servants to the powers that be, which are nothing compared to God. Before we knew God as our Father, so before you know something, you were enslaved, but the knowledge of this very statement had the power to set you free. 
Before we knew God as our Father, we became His children. We're unwitting servants to the powers that be, which are nothing compared to God. But now that we truly know Him and understand how deeply we're loved by Him, why would we, even for a moment, consider turning back to those weak and feeble principles of religion as though we're still subject to them? Why would we want to go backwards into the bondage of religious scrupulously religion scrupulously observing rituals like special days, celebrations of the new moon, annual festivals, and sacred years? I'm so alarmed about you that I'm beginning to wonder if my labor in ministry among you was a waste of time. That's, that's Paul speaking here. Before we knew, verses 8 and 9, before we knew our God as our Father, and became his children, we're unwitting servants to the powers that be, which are nothing compared to God. But now that we truly know him and we understand how deeply loved by him we are, why would we even for a moment consider turning back to weak and feeble principles of religion as if we were still subject to them? Now that you've been set free, you're not gonna go back. shot water over here. All right. Go to Mark chapter number four. I'm going to pull this up over here so I can jump back and forth to that. Mark chapter number four. I want to start in the very first verse. I want to bring some things here to light. And before I do, let's let's camp out right here. I'm gonna and I'm gonna keep referencing Galatians chapter four. Before we knew God, somebody say no. All right. Before you know something, before you know something, you're subject to other things. But after you know it, you no longer have to be subject to it. What's this sound like? People perish for what? A lack of knowledge. There's two reasons people perish. They perish for these two reasons. They perish for a lack of knowledge and a lack of vision. Proverbs says, without vision, the people perish. Hosea said, people perish for a lack of knowledge. So if you don't have knowledge and you don't have vision, then you are going to perish. Isn't that interesting? Who wants to perish? Come on. Man, you need to, you, you got a fruit drive happening in you. So you're, you're a non-perishable item. How do I become non-perishable? I better get vision and I better know something. This is, this is amazing. If I want to not perish, then I better have vision and I better know something. It's interesting because the same, the same Hebrew word that, that, that uh, Solomon used in the proverb that people without vision, the people perish, is the same Hebrew word or, or the root. The root of those words are the same that Hosea was talking about when he said without, without knowledge, people are perishing. It comes from the Hebrew word, which means yada, which the Hebrew word doesn't mean yada. The Hebrew word is yada. Okay, and that word means careful observation, seeing through careful observation. So people perish without vision. Now I'm glad you're somebody's already. Well, no, James James corrected all this, Josh, when he said we walk by faith, not by sight. And I'm glad that you pointed that out so that I could debunk that thinking in you for just a moment, because James was not talking about natural sight; he was talking about spiritual sight. I'm sorry. He was talking. He was he was talking about natural sight, not spiritual sight. He was saying that we do not walk by natural sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. He's saying that we walk by spiritual sight, not natural sight. That's what he's saying, because because. Hosea wants you to know, Solomon wants you to know that you're going to die, you're going to perish if you don't have vision and knowledge. The dream of heaven is for the knowledge of the glory of the Lord to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And Jesus is like, I'm not willing that any should perish, but all have everlasting life. I'm not willing that anybody, I don't, I don't want anybody to not know who I am. 
and out of the intimate no cease knowledge of who that I am that I am God's son and if you've seen me you've seen the father if you've seen the father you've seen me and if you understand that revelation then you can have an intimate knowledge of who that I really am and it will cause your life to walk in an unperishable manner that eternity has begun for you and you are now forever you're now forever. So I need a knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. Knowledge of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Didn't we point that out two weeks ago? The beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord, which is not actually fear as in I'm afraid of him. It's fear as in I'm in awe of him. Is is actually a terribly translated word. It means awe, worship. The beginning of all wisdom is the worship of God. That I intimately might know him. That I might know him. He already, he already, he, come on. The more you know him, he's already fashioned you. Now to know the one that fashioned me will unlock a greater revelation that out of that knowledge and out of that vision and out of that insight through careful observation, through careful observation and in spiritual sight, I will know the Father. I will know the Father. So before... Before I knew him, I was subject to things in my life. I was subject to seasons. I was subject to days. I was subject to the laws. I was subject to religion. I was subject to the rulers of religion. I was subject to the rulers of the dark world because I did not know him. But the moment I knew him, I no longer had to be subject to what I previously was subject to. Follow it track it. David, David, Psalm number one, he comes out with this type of thinking of a never withering leaf. Welcome to a new day where there's not a withering leaf. What does that mean? That you're an evergreen that is not subject to the seasons of the earth. Josh, so long as the earth remains, thanks for bringing that up. I'm glad you got there. But so long as the earth remains, what do we know? Seed time and harvest, winter. So long as the earth remains, we're going to have these seasons. But it does not mean that you are subject to the seasons because the earth has the seasons because you are in the world, but not of the world. You are in the world, but not of the world you are of heaven and heaven has trees that bear fruit 12 months of the year time doesn't even exist there I just have to say 12 months of the year because so we can relate to that there is no time circular unbroken forever so since there's trees bearing 12 fruit 12 months of the year, they are not subject to the seasons. You are on earth, but you are of heaven. That means I'm no longer subject. The fruit in my life is no longer subject to the seasons in the earth. Think about it. Nearness to God will fix this. That's why Jesus curses the fig tree because it didn't have fruit. Go read it. He cursed it. It didn't have fruit because, and it wasn't even the season for fruit. Are you with me right now? Okay, maybe you're not. Let's picture this, all right? After church, let's all go down. To, let's, go, let's go down here to Prairie Grove and find that blueberry patch, and let's go out there and pick blueberries. How stupid, Right? We can't go there and pick any... They don't even have buds on them right now. Why? Because it's not the season for blueberries. But if we went out in that patch to pick those blueberries and there's no blueberries there and that was frustrating to us and then we cursed those trees and they died, Jesus goes to the fig tree when it was not the season for figs and it did not have figs and he cursed it that it died because you can't get this close to me and not be supernatural. You saw me coming a long way off, friend. 
and nature has to respond because when you get this near to me, when you get this this near in proximity to who that I am, then your life can become more fruitful regardless of the season. So you may have been told that you're barren. You may have felt like you're barren. You may have been in a barren moment for some time and you thought, well, this is just the hand that I'm dealt, but I want to encourage you in this moment. The closer you get to the Father and the more you discover about Him, the more fruit you're going to produce in your life. Barrenness is the condition you're in, but never let your condition become the identity of who you are. But if you see it as God's opportunity, it will not. If you fail to see your issue as God's opportunity, it'll oftentimes try to overtake you and become your identity. That's that's why you know her as the lady with the issue of blood. Mark that junk out. It's not inspired of God. That's not who she is. She lived the rest of her life healed from her issue of blood. We don't even know her name. We just know she was... Lady, the lady that was healed of the issue of blood because people, even 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 people that translated the scripture, they identified man with a withered hand. We identify you by your dysfunction, by your issue. You don't think that's true? Find out people people identify you by what you got going on in your life. Even when we're describing people, hey, do you remember this person? No, I don't remember them. Hey, they're the one that did this. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember them. We remember by what they did. We remember by we remember by their actions. We remember by their by their issues. We remember by their dysfunction. But God doesn't remember you that way. He sees you as an overcomer. He sees you as free, not subject to the seasons of the earth. You are a fruitful one. Let's go verse chapter four, chapter four, verse one. I don't feel like I'm gonna get a whole hour here. Once again, Jesus went to teach the people on the shore and this part's gonna be review. I I gotta, but we need to grab it as the whole concept here and, and merge some things together. Once again, Jesus went to teach the people on the shore of the Lake Galilee and a massive crowd surrounded him. The crowd was so huge that he got into the boat and he taught the people from the, from the water. And he taught them many things by using parables to illustrate spiritual truths, saying, consider this. This was the first thing he's doing. Consider this. A farmer went out to sow seeds. And as he cast his seed, some fell among the beaten path, and soon the birds came and ate it. Others fell onto the gravel and with no topsoil, and the seeds quickly sprouted since the soil had no depth. But when the days grew hot, the sprouts were scorched and withered because they had insufficient roots. Other seeds fell among thorns, so when the seeds sprouted, they did When they sprouted, so did the thorns, crowding out the young plants. So the young plants, the 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 young plants. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So they they could produce no grain. But some of the seeds fell onto good rich soil that kept producing a good harvest. Somebody say good rich soil, that's me. You just prophesy over yourself till you become it, all right? Good rich soil kept producing a good harvest. Some yielded 30, some 60, and some even 100 times as much as they planted. If you understand this, then you need to respond. So there's four conditions here of the, of the soil, all right? Some have no roots. Some fell here. Some fell there. Some fell among thorns. And, and when they sprouted, so did the thorns, and it crowded out the young plants so that they could produce no grain. The things, the young plants, the things that have not reached maturity in you begin to be choked out. Okay? We find out these seeds are God's words. All right, verse 10. Afterwards, Jesus, his disciples, and those close to him remained behind to ask Jesus about this parable. He said to them, the privilege of intimately knowing the mystery of God's kingdom realm has been granted to you, but not to others. 
where everything is revealed in parables. For even when they see what I do, they will not understand. And when they hear what I say, they will learn nothing. Otherwise, they would repent, change the way they think, and be forgiven. Then he said to them, if you do not understand this parable, how will you understand any parable? Let me explain. The farmer sows the word as seed. And what falls on the beaten path represents those who hear the word, but immediately Satan appears and snatches it from their hearts. The seed sown on gravel represents those who hear the word and receive it joyfully. But because their hearts fail to sink a deep root into the word, they don't endure for long. For when the trouble or persecution comes on around them on account of that word, they immediately wilt and they fall away. And the seed sown among the thorns represents those who hear the word, but they allow the cares of life, the seduction of wealth, and the desires of other things to crowd out and choke the word so that it produces nothing. But the seed sown on good soil represents those who open their hearts, receive the word, and their lives bear good fruit. Some yield a harvest 30, 60, and even 100 times more than was sown. All right? So he's explaining this parable that we just read in this way, in this way. The, and it, depending on your translation, this is what you need to know. The, the seeds are all the same. The soil is what was changed. The soil was the, was the, the seed is the common denominator in all four scenarios. The seeds are the words of God. His seeds are words, Okay. Your translation may even say that, that the seeds are the words of God, depending if you're reading into the King James. The seeds are the words of God. So God speaks and a seed leaves his mouth and, and goes to your heart. Now, the heart is the condition here that is being dealt with. The heart is being dealt with because some some people's hearts are are, are, are a beaten path that represents the, the, the word. They hear the word, but Satan immediately snatches it up and takes it from them. And they're immediately robbed from the very thing that they just heard. Okay? Track that, track that. I don't know, so, so just in perspective, I feel like that we're probably dealing with believers in all four scenarios here. I want you to see that. But whether we are or we're not, I'm not splitting those hairs with you right now. All right? The second one, was sown on gravel, and this represents those who hear the word, they receive it joyfully, they come and they clap at the sermon, and they're like, dude, that's awesome. Thank you, God's doing an amazing thing. But their their hearts failed to sink any root in the word that they heard, and they don't endure long. Why? Because trouble and persecution comes on account of the promise that they received and immediately they fall away because they hit a roadblock and they cannot endure the promise that God spoke in them. Hold fast the profession of your faith. Then the third one, is a seed sown among thorns. Thorns, I, I, I like this. I don't, li- I don't like the thorns took it out, but I, I love this because thorns, I'm glad he said thorns, like he knew exactly what he was doing. He said thorns, and thorns are a product of another seed. This is the person who's got a lot of voices going on in their heart, and they got a lot of directions that are going on in their heart, and they heard the promise of God, and they held on to that. They received it glad, but the promise of God did not reach its full maturity because while the seed had sprouted into a young plant, because God's promise will get to a place of maturity where you can reap the harvest of what that he said. In, in essence, that you will hold in your hand what you heard in your heart if you can endure through the process. And so this young plant is there and all of a sudden there are some thorns that begin to pop up. Weeds pop up way quicker than harvest. And these weeds and these thorns are popping up to choke out. They're choking out. So these thorns are not from God, but there is one posing. There is not, come on, you got God that is the lion of Judah, and you got one that's that's roaring the, to and fro about the earth as a lion. He's not the lion, but he poses as a lion. Are you with me? 
He'll oftentimes come quoting scriptures and twisting that to you. This is how he did with Jesus. So apparently you better know what God said. And he starts releasing seeds into your mind. And they start choking out and doing war against the things that God said if you give it room to. If you give it room to. They're choked out by the cares of life, the seduction of wealth, the desires for other things. All these other voices. Then verse 20, the seed sown on good soil. So it's all talking about the condition of heart. Skip down to verse 21. He gave them this parable. No one lights a lamp right after that. Here it is. No one lights a lamp only to place it under a basket or under the bed. It is meant to be placed on the lampstand. For there is nothing that is hidden that won't be disclosed, and there is no secret that won't be brought out into the light. If you understand what I'm saying, you need to respond. Verse 24. Then he said to them, Be diligent to understand the meaning behind everything you hear. For as you do, more understanding will be given to you, and according to the depth of your longing to understand, much more will be added to you. This is the 30, 60, 100 folder. The hungry, the hungry 30 folder will eventually become a 60 folder because they stayed hungry in their 30 fold. They stayed hungry and they begin to multiply. And the hungrier you are, come on. The hungrier you are for revelation, the more revelation will be poured out to you. So seek to understand everything that you hear. Seek to dig out every riddle. That's why it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out because I'm hiding things for you to find. And if you will just dig, you will increase the glory of God on your life by uncovering the mysteries of what I am saying. For those who listen with open hearts, verse 25, more be added to you, verse 25. For those who listen with open hearts will receive more revelation. This is the parable. This is about the condition of the heart the entire time. This is the condition of the heart. We never moved from even the lampstand. It never moved from the condition of the heart. Who has this and, and hides it? No, it's, it's, it's to be revealed, to give light to all who are in the house. But those who listen with open hearts, or or for those who listen with open hearts will receive more revelation, but those who don't listen with open hearts will lose the little that they think that they have. Moving forward, verse 26, Jesus told them this parable. God's kingdom, I mean, he says, he says such on a roll right here at this, like, like, you know, the band is going at this point. And Jesus told him this parable. God's kingdom realm is like someone spreading seed on the ground. Think about this. His kingdom realm is like somebody spreading seed on the ground. The kingdom of heaven is like this. And he goes to bed and he gets up day after day, day after day. How many days he gets up after one night? No, sir. No, ma'am. Day after day, he gets up. And the seed sprouts, and it grows tall, though he knows not how. All by itself it sprouts, and the soil produces a crop. First the green stem, then the head of the st- on the stalk, and then the fully developed grain in the head. Then when the grain is ripe, he immediately puts the sickle to the grain because the harvest time has come. I want to grab this right here. This particular parable is only told in Mark. This particular one. God's kingdom realm is like somebody spreading seed on the ground. He goes to bed and he gets up day after day. Day after day. What are the seeds? They're the words of God. Somebody, come on. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Somebody hears the words of God and there. What is the soil? What is the soil? And he he said it like this. Why, Why do you keep referring back to the parable of the sower? Because he said, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any parable? I'm giving you keys right here in the parable of the sower to unlock every parable you'll ever read. The words are seeds. The soil is your heart. And the condition of your heart will determine what grows in your life. The kingdom of heaven is like is like somebody who spreads the word of God on their heart. 
and he goes to bed and he gets up day after day hanging on to the promise. He's hanging on to the promise and he's hanging on to the promise. Not one day, not two days. We don't know an indefinite amount of time. This is what we know. He spreads the word of God in his heart and day after day, night after night, he gets up. He gets up day after day and he, and the seeds begin to sprout and, and it begins to grow tall though he does not know how. He does not know how the word of God is being increasing in his life, how it produced what it produced in his life, but he, it's, it's, that's a mystery. The seeds are going to grow if you if you'll just day after day, I'm going to keep doing this. Day after day, I'm not going to stop. Day after day, I'm going to just continue going out there. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to let the the immature, the immature, uh, the immature plant. It's not that God's word is immature, but it hasn't reached the fullness of maturity to you yet. He's talking about the process of time and holding on to God's promise in the process of time. All by itself, it sprouts. All by itself. It did not need your guidance to sprout. It just needed you to tend the soil. Man, I got to get you to see this. The farmer does not have to watch over the seed. He has to watch over the soil. The seed, you can't, there's nothing you can do to make the seed do what the seed's already going to do. But if you will condition the soil, the seed will do what the seed was going to do. I can't come. The, the seed just does it all by itself. There is no on my part. There is no striving on my part that could cause the promise of God to come to pass. I just have to keep tilling the ground of my heart, saying that I'm not going to let weeds grow here and I'm not going to let thorns grow here. I got to watch over my garden. I'm going to keep the snakes out and I'm going to watch over this thing because God has given me a precious word and I will latch on to that precious word and that word will do exactly what that word said that it will do if I will condition the soil of my heart. All by itself, it's going to sprout. Watch it now. Watch verse 28. All by itself, it sprouts, and the soil produces a crop. Well, crap. Come on, man. That's that. All by itself, it does this. All by itself, the seed does what seeds do. But the soil is, come on, the soil is what produced the harvest. You couldn't produce, you couldn't make that seed grow, but you could watch over the soil. And because you watched over the soil, because you watched over your heart, there was something that was growing in your life. The soil produces the crop. How does it do this? In the process of time of constantly grooming the heart for what the Father has released in your life. What does that look like? Well, first, it looks like, it looks like the green stem. When you see the green shoot, be encouraged. I'm tending the soil. When you see the green shoot, you don't go on vacation. You see the green shoot, you keep, you keep, you keep watching over the soil. Why? Because God's growing something in my life. He's growing something in my life. And then more time and the stalk, the head on the stalk. And then the fully developed grain in the head. Isn't that amazing? He says it like this: so long as the earth remains, in Genesis, he says, so long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest. So I just want you, I want you to put commas here, even though there's probably not in your translation. I want you to think of, I want you to see it from a different angle here. So long as the earth remains, seed time. Don't, don't put those two words together. Seed, comma, time, comma, and harvest. Okay? So long as the earth remains, there will be seed, there will be time, and there will be harvest. So long as the earth remains... I am, my seeds are not subject to my seasons. They are subject to my heart. Man, you're going to see this. 
my seeds in my life and everything that God said about me is not subject to what your grandparents thought about you. It's not subject. Now listen, thank God for godly parents and grandparents that were breathing the word of God in your life. I'm talking about the one that said that he was your father, but he he just abused you and it wasn't anything good coming out of his mouth towards your life or the mother that didn't nurture you or maybe you were robbed of a situation when you were just, a, when you were young and a juvenile and a minor in it all. Maybe that was something that was happening in your life, but I want to encourage you in this moment, the word that God spoke over you beautifully and wonderfully made and your soul knows it very well. The word God spoke over you that you're the head and not the tail, that you're blessed laying down, that you're blessed rising up, that you're blessed coming in, that you're blessed going out, that the heathen will rise and call you blessed. That word that God spoke over me, that I am the healed of the Lord. That word that he spoke over me, that if you serve me, I'll save you and your household. That word that he spoke over me, that I'm an overcomer, that not death, nor life, nor things past, present, or future could separate me from the love of God and what he was saying over my life. That word is not subject to my winter seasons. That word is not subject to the storms in my life. That word is not subject to my financial situation. That word is not subject to the county that you vote in, to the side of the tracks you are born on, and the zip code that you call home. The word that God has for your life is forever. He speaks forever words into a world of time. And he inserted that seed into my heart. The only thing that God's words are subject to is the condition of my soil. And my soil has been empowered to produce his promise. I don't have to strive to make the seed grow. I just have to watch the condition of my heart. I have to not stop believing what God said. You stop believing that seed's going to grow, it'll get choked out. Weeds are going to start shooting up everywhere. Why? Because you're going to stop de-weeding it. Why? Why do I need to de-weed it? Because there's another enemy of your, there's an enemy of your soul that is casting seeds into your life. Uproot those weeds. Stop talking to the snakes in your garden and tell them to go. Then when the grain's ripe, he immediately puts the sickle to the grain and harvest time has come. Harvest time has come. Let's track it. Verse number 30. Are you all okay? You okay? Because I, I, I need to do the whole thing. And I also would like to get Exodus 14, but I don't know if you can sit here for that. And he taught them this parable. How can I describe God's kingdom realm? Let me illustrate it in this parable. It is like the mustard seed. Man. It's like the seed. The kingdom is the seed, the tiniest of all seeds. Yet when it springs up and grows, it becomes the largest plant in the garden. And with with so many enormous spreading branches, even birds can nest in its shade. Man, I don't have time. I I wonder how many nations are represented by some kind of bird or something like that that could rest in the kingdom shade. Here we go, here we go. Verse 33, let's go. Jesus used many parables such as these and he taught the people and they learned according to their ability to understand. Isn't that interesting? According to their ability, to what gives you the ability to understand? He gave you an ability to understand, but the hungrier you are to understand, the more he increased that ability. Man, he never spoke to them without using parables, but would wait until they were alone before he explained the meanings to the disciples. He speaks in parables, but when you get alone in your secret place, he begins to unveil the mysteries of what he has for you. Later that day, man, I love it. I love it because it's not just a later moment, but it's later that day when all this teaching is happening. Later that day, that day, that day after just, I don't know if this is all the same day, but I'm going to just take some poetic licensing and say that it is. Later that day, after it grew dark, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. 
He hasn't done any miracles. He's just been revealing mysteries. And now we're in this moment where he's demonstrating everything he's just said. What are God's words? They're seats. Let us cross over to the other side. Is that red letter in your Bible? It's red letter. Unless you don't have the red letter edition, then it's not. But, you know, what does red letter mean? It means Jesus said it. So what am I saying? God spoke. The Son of God spoke and said, let us go to the other side. The seed has been released. Where is our destination? The other side. We have to cross this to get to where God's wanting us to go. Man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I'm, can I just story weave some stuff here? I don't know if that's, but we're going to make it a thing. Ex, like Exodus, I'm not going to go read it. But in Exodus, like 14, well, it starts, there's a lot of stuff happening. But they're, they're like 14, 15, and, and, they, and they're, they're back. Is the, the army of Pharaoh's army, they, the, all the, the ten plagues have happened, and they go out, and they've got the enemy's gold, and they've got all this stuff, and they get to the Red Sea. And they're supposed to cross it. They're supposed to cross over this body of water that is impossible. There's an impossible situation that is there. And they begin to question and say, why did God bring us out here? God was, what is one of the first things he was, God was wanting Moses to do? He said, tell my people. My people is the implication of identity. Whose people? They're my people. They're my people go tell my people he's with them he's like I'm with you Moses go tell my people go tell my people the God of their fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob has sent me has sent you to them he said well, well, what, when they ask when they ask what is his name what did I tell them tell them that I am the I am Tell them the I am that I am has sent you. What if they still won't believe? Give them this sign. These are my people, and I've heard their cry in slavery. I've heard their cry from slavery, and out of slavery, they were crying, and I need to remind them who they are. I need to remind them who they are. Why? Because 400 years has passed. 400 years has passed. I find this fascinating. 400 years has passed and a Pharaoh has arose that knew not Joseph. That's what the scripture says. A Pharaoh arose that knew not Joseph. I find that fascinating. And so now there's somebody not remembering Joseph and the people begin to cry out from slavery. He said, Moses, go. Tell them the I am has sent you to them. Why? I need to remind them who they are. And we're about to all this. We're about to unfold 10 plagues. He didn't tell Moses all this, but he's about to unfold 10 plagues. He's going to get them out there to the Red Sea. And he says, Moses, as if he hasn't stretched enough, I need you to stretch, Moses. And he stretched, and there was a strong east wind. And there was a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right. And the wind blew all night long, drying out the ground. Spirit wind. Blew all night long, and they walk over on dry ground. The impossible begin to happen at the word of God. At the word of God. They get to the other side, and he says, now stretch again. Because Moses needed more stretching because of, you know, he was already an 80-year-old person at this point. And he stretches again. And the water comes back over the Egyptians because he had said to them that what you look at what you're looking at today, you'll never see this again. I'm about to drown out what's been harassing you. I'm about to drown out the thing that's been holding you in slavery. This is the watery grave of baptism, but I don't have time to run down that road right now. But he, he, and they, they start, the, the chariot wheels get heavy and they die in the sea and they begin to sing the song of Moses. Exodus 15. They begin to sing the song of Moses. 
Miriam, after the Song of Moses, gets out the tambourine on the other side of the water. And this is the one that was like, you know, hey, and, they, and they begin to question God before they cross the sea. And this is their question. Did God bring us out here in the desert because there are no graves? There's not enough graves in Egypt. He brought us out here because there's not enough graves where we came from so that he could kill us out here. No, 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 no. Why? Because when you get between a rock and a hard place, the enemy will always come at you with this question, does God really care about you? You better not be ignorant of that device. Why? What's he really saying? Does God not care about you? He's actually trying to get you to question your identity of who you are. Because what father does not care if his sons perish? He's trying to get me to question my identity. Watch it now. Mark chapter 4. They're having to cross a large body of water. The sea's not splitting this time. Later that day, Jesus said to the disciples, let's cross to the other side. The, the seed has went forth. After they sent the crowd away, they shoved off from shore with him. And he, and he had been, because he, as he had been teaching from the boat, and there were other boats that sailed with them. Suddenly, suddenly, they were crossing the lake and a ferocious tempest arose with violent winds and waves that were crashing into the boat until it was all but swamped. So God has spoken the word that we're going to this destination and all of a sudden there was something that was coming against them trying to get to their destination. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. The seed that you've received in the soil of your heart should not be conditioned to the storm in your life. I need to say that again. I don't know if somebody got that or not, but you need to hang on to that. The seed that God has put in your heart should not be subject to the storm that's happening in your life. Suddenly, they were crossing the lake and a ferocious tempest arose. This is a demonic storm. I'll show you that in a minute, but if we got time. With violent winds and waves, but they're crashing into the boat until it was all but swamped. But Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. I love the implicit detail of this, that Jesus is not freaking out. He's calmly sleeping in the boat on a cushion. Why? Because he knew what he had already said. And he's demonstrating what he had already taught them previously that day. When I speak something, if you'll condition it in your heart, you'll make it to what I said. But Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. Verse 39. So they shook him awake saying, what did they say? Teacher, don't you even care that we're all about to die? Because anytime God gives you a promise, the first thing the enemy's going to do is try to get you to question the care of God when that promise doesn't happen overnight. He's trying to get you to question your identity. Why? Because what kind of evil father would not care about his sons dying? But we have a heavenly father who is greater than any evil father, who even evil fathers, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more so does your father in heaven? If you being who you are know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more do I care about them? How much more? How much more so is my care towards you? You're questioning my care, which is actually you questioning the identity of who you are of who you are. This frustrated Jesus. Fully awake, he rebuked the storm. He shouted to the sea, hush, calm down, peace be still. And all at once, the wind stopped howling and the water became perfectly calm. This is a demonic storm. It's a demonic storm. How do I, I'm 100% certain. This is not up for debate. If you, did, if you thought, no, it's just a regular storm and it's a strong storm, then, then um, you're, you're wrong. You've probably been wrong before. We'll probably be wrong again at another point, but you're wrong about this, okay? It is a demonic storm, 100%. Why? Because Jesus rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace be still. Okay? The peace, now I also like it, because he doesn't actually speak to the storm itself, but he speaks to the peace. Are you, are you with me right now? He speaks to the peace that is already there. Peace 
years in turmoil will create storms in your life. Man, the condition of your heart is where your peace is at that surpasses understanding. And you've got peace on the inside of you, but when the storm starts raging on the inside of you, you need the king to speak to the peace on the inside of you and say, peace be still, because I got my pieces out of control here. There's a turmoil that's happening in my life. But Jesus would not rebuke this situation if it was from God. Think about that. Because then a house divided can't stand. He, do I cast out devils by the name of Be- Beelzebub? Well, a house divided cannot stand. This isn't going to work like this. This isn't going to work. So I need to speak to the peace that is within the storm. I'm not even concerned about the storm. I'm speaking to the peace that is existing there that you cannot see because you've been blinded by the weapon that's been formed against you. And so he says, peace be still. Why is there peace already there? Because my peace I leave with you, John 14, 27. My peace I leave with you. I love it because the same Greek word for my peace I leave with you in John 14, 27 is the same Greek word that he spoke in Mark chapter number four. He's speaking to the same peace and he's saying for that thing to be peace, be still. There's a weapon formed against me that came from the enemy, but I'm not going to address that weapon. I need to address the condition of your soil that have you have let my word become subject to what's been formed against you and it's about to choke you out from getting to where I said you're going but since I'm here I'm going to speak to the root of the issue and it's the soil in your heart that no longer has peace because of what's going on on the outside peace be still and it all comes to a calm It all comes to calm and they turned and the disciples said to them, all at at once the wind stopped how and the water became perfectly calm. Verse number 40, then he turned to his disciples and he asked them this question, why are you so afraid? Question, and then he asked them one more. Why haven't you learned to trust yet? The condition in your heart has prevented you from seeing beyond what's been formed against you. Well, how do you, you Josh, this, I don't, I don't, listen, listen, listen. Why is the other side so important? They begin verse 41. They, they were overwhelmed with fear and awe and worship. They said to one another, who is this man that has such authority that even the wind and the waves obey him? Speak to the peace that was already there. I wonder if there's anybody in the room today or watching later at another moment online that has been in such a stormy situation when you've already had a word of perfect peace. And the manifestation, and you need to go back to the soil of your heart and say, you know what? I cannot make that seed grow, but the soil will cause the crop to come. And I can condition the soil And I can begin to uproot all these other ideas and all these other ways, Abraham. You didn't have to go see Hagar because God already had given you a word. Hagar was the weed that popped up in your life. Now, listen, listen, let me help you right here. Because God, because God, God did not tell him to go to Hagar. Sarah did. You go read that. Sarah did. Hagar's like in her 30s at this point. And Sarah thought it was a good idea for Abraham, who's in his, you know, he's probably about 90-ish, in his 90s, somewhere in there, to sleep with this lady. And Abraham apparently thought it was a good idea too. I don't know. I just, I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. And, and, and she has Ishmael. She has Ishmael, but that Ishmael was not God's idea. This was the weeds that was. Now, I'm not saying that Ishmael, listen, let me help you. Symbolically, yes. But even after something that happened that should not have happened, God can still put blessing on things. 
And you find, I find this highly, highly enticing that at, at a certain age, when the, when the slave girl, when the bond woman and her son are mocking the promise that has now came, who is Isaac, and when the bond woman and her son are mocking the promise and Sarah says, you got to get them out and go, send them out of here. Abraham's the Bill Gates of his day, not, not mentally, just, you know, financially. And he's the Bill Gates of his day financially and he sends them out in the desert with a loaf of bread and a water. I don't, I'm not going to preach about child support, but I'm just... And he, and he sends them out there. And, and it's interesting because they, they're in a, a desperate measure situation. Their world has just turned upside down. And Hagar begins to pray. You don't have to take my word for this. You can go read it later. She begins to pray. And she says, Lord, You've basically, you've brought me out here, you've brought me out here to die. God help us of why have you inflicted, she's blaming God. Go read the prayer. She starts blaming God. She starts blaming God for being out in the desert. That was not God's fault. That was, that was the, the, the bond woman's son that was mocking the promise. And then Abraham sent you out in the desert, not God. I need you to hear it. The angel of the Lord. No, Josh, the angel of the Lord came to her. I'm glad you pointed that out. Go read that story. The angel of the Lord came to Hagar and the angel of the Lord brought this message that the Lord has heard the prayer of the lad. What the what? Why don't we have his prayer? We've got Hagar's prayer telling God what he did wrong and while they're in that situation, but the lad was a bow shot away. God bless bow hunters. And he was a bow shot away. And, and, and while he was over there, he's praying. I find this interesting. Hagar's blaming God for being out in the desert. Why is she doing that? Because she's the bondwoman of Sarah. She's Sarah's maidservant who also, if you go back several years, you'll find where Sarah makes this statement that God has made me barren. What? God made you fruitful. The weapon formed against you is barrenness, Sarah. And she blamed God for something he did not do. And we get years later, and the maidservant is in a situation, and she starts blaming God for something he did not do. And the angel comes and said, hey, we're gonna, we've heard the prayer of the lad. <laughs> I don't know if that's discouraging or encouraging for Hagar in this moment. But we've heard the prayer of the lad. We're going to help you. We heard the prayer. Why? Who's the lad been hanging out with? Not Sarah. He's been hanging out with Abraham. Son, let me tell you, when there was not a way, God made a way. When I didn't know where I was going and I didn't know how it was going to happen, God did this. When Isaac, after, after Isaac had come, come of an age, probably around the age of 13-ish, somewhere in there, and, and, and Ishmael and Isaac were getting into it out there. So it, I, I, uh, Ishmael had been hanging around for some time, hearing after Isaac had came along of how he was the promise and how this is what God, the fulfillment of that, how God did the impossible when Sarah was in her 90s and Abraham was 100 and they had a kid. This is crazy. But the Lord heard the prayer of the lad. Man, what's happening? The condition of your heart of what God's actually having to say over you is very important. Maintain it. Why is it such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal? Because if you fail to steward the soil in your life that is your heart, you will fail to experience the fullness of the promise that God has for you. But if you'll keep tending that soil, you'll hold in your hand what you heard in your heart. You'll see it. You'll see it. Man, I gotta quit.
In Mark chapter number five, how do I know that is also just, you know, part two of the demon possessed storm there? When they get to the other side, there's a man in the tombs that had been living there, cutting himself, wailing and screaming, living naked there in the tombs. And he comes out and he runs out to, to meet Jesus and said, I've seen you from afar off. This man is possessed with 6,000 demons and he's seen Jesus from afar off. That demonic, the demons inside of that man created that storm on the water and Jesus calmed it all down and said, even though the demonic is coming against you, there's peace on the inside of you and I need to speak to the peace of the situation. Not to the weapon formed because there are going to be weapons formed against you, but they're not going to prosper. Stop giving empowerment to the weapons formed against you. If you believe the lie, you empower the liar. Do not believe the lie. Empower the truth. Empower the the truth in your life. It's a big deal. Why? Because Jesus sets this man free and he sets him over 10 cities. The Decapolis. 10 cities. Why is it a big deal that you cross over? Can I, I, need, I need five more minutes right here. What's a big deal that you cross over the sea that's in your life? Because God's wanting to drown out the things that have been harassing you and enslaving you. Why is it a big deal that you follow out of obedience of what you could not strive for? I just need to keep the condition of my heart right. Why? Because he's about to bring a level of freedom to my life that I've never experienced before. Why? Because addiction is about to be shook off me and affliction is about to be shook off me. Why do I need to get to the other side? Because cities are my inheritance and he's going to do something in a region that's going to shake the known world because I got in the boat and trusted what he said. What's he doing in your life? What's he speaking over you? Keep that soil ready for everything God said. Everything he said. God's kingdom is like somebody spreading seed on the ground. I love it. Stand with me. You know that man, it said he spread seed. I need you to hear that. The kingdom is like a farmer, a man that spreads seed on his heart. He did not put it in a compartmentalized place. He did not compartmentalize God's word and say it's only effective here, but he spread it over his heart and said in every arena of my life, this seed is effective. In every arena of my life, the seed is going to grow because I am going to watch over every corner. Maybe God needs to come and sweep out the corners of your heart again and say, hey, we're, we're, we're enlarging territories and we're increasing capacity. I'm going to make sure that every corner of my heart is tilled. That way I can spread the word of the Lord and his promises over every, over every corner of my heart. Over every chamber spread the seed the word of God is spread over my heart out of a out of the man's out of the out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks as a man thinks in his heart so is he I better keep that soil right because that is going to determine my my identity isn't coming from my mind. It's coming from the abundance of my heart and what I think right here about who God says that I am. I better keep this. I better keep this soil tilled. I better continue to condition this soil. Why? Because I better not believe I am who I really am not. I'm done spending life on the proving ground of who I already am. Condition that heart and let your your identity come to light in in a way that it never has. Man, I need another hour. I'm done. I'm I'm done. I'm done. You want chicken? I'm done. Feel it. Blessed are the hungry for revelation. Father, this is so good to us. 
what you say today, Father. Thank you for using me as a vehicle. God, forgive me, you're not using me. Thank you for flowing through me as a son. Nobody wants to be used. You don't use us. You flow through us. We are the instruments of heaven releasing a frequency of sound into the earth. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for how you flow today. Let us engrave this on our heart, God, however, however long that it takes, God. We're not in a hurry to move on to the next thing. However long that it takes, Father, let us grasp this. God, what if, what if we just gave you the rest of our life, the rest of our life to let the kingdom run wild in us? And we'd not have any more compartmentalized words. I'm going to keep that separate because that's for here and that's for there. But Lord, we burned it down and said no more fences and no more borders. No more fences and no more borders, but let your word run to every area of my career, of my marriage, of my family, of my finance, of my business, of my, of my spirit. God, every area. God, there is, there is, Lord, it's just all there and connected. God, we're not compartmentalizing your word. It's effective in everything. It's effective in everything. Father, I thank you for doing it. Thank you, God, for doing it. Lord, we just speak this word of encouragement over them. Lord, to steward that soil and don't stop believing. Hold fast the profession of their faith. Hold fast what God has said to you. Don't be convinced that the weed is supposed to be there. Don't be convinced that the thorns are supposed to be there. The enemy's coming against your identity because out of that heart is what is who you're going to become. And the Lord is making sure that you get the kingdom in there and say, spread it over the whole thing. Spread it over every area. Father, I thank you for doing it. Thank you, God, for doing it. God, you are so awesome. Lord, and as every service is a service of, of, of miracles, signs, and wonders, is a service for that opportunity and the glory of God. So, Lord, if there's somebody here with a situation, an addiction, an affliction, a disease, whatever that it is, that is a representation of God's glory about to manifest, Father, we just decree it is for your glory, and we give it to you. So, Lord, if there's somebody here, if there's somebody watching by camera lens at a later moment, or they're in the room right now, and they want to lay hold of this and say, Father, I want the manifestation of me being the healed of the Lord to actually manifest in my life in a greater capacity, in a greater degree. I want the manifestation that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and the Spirit of the Lord is on the inside of me, so there must be freedom on the inside of me. God, maybe somebody needs to be free indeed today. Maybe somebody needs to be set free of an affliction, an addiction, or a disease. God, whatever that they need to be set free from, Father, we just release freedom over that area, over that area. If you, need, if you need healing of any kind, just, just stretch your hand to heaven and receive what he's pouring out. Father, we surrender. God, God, I can't strive and make something and make this happen or that I can't strive and make a seed grow, but we can condition the soil and make sure that we're believing that seed's gonna grow. And Lord, and make sure that we're understanding, Lord, that I can't strive to do this, but I can surrender. And so out of surrender, we just stretch our hands to you, Father, and say that, Lord, we surrender our ideologies. We surrender, God, our thoughts. We 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 surrender our thoughts, God, our thoughts that are, God, we really take captive every thought, God, that's trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God and say, Father, to know you at a greater level, to know you in a greater capacity will unlock greater revelation. Revelation, Lord, and that revelation is we are the healed of the Lord, that we are free indeed. So, Father, we just echo the words of heaven, God, the, the beautiful echoes of heaven, God, that we say you are free indeed. Chains fall. Chains break. Sickness go. God, sickness go. Sickness be broken from them, God. Let sickness be cast from them in this moment, that they stop thinking it's not 
noble to bear their pain, to cover up where they are anemically shamed from what has caused things and what they believe caused things in their life. But we cast our cares on you and we are never going to wear the shame face again for our issues and our diseases. God, we give them to you because they're not ours. If God, if you didn't say it, it's not mine. If you didn't say it, it's not mine. Father, it's not mine. Disease is not ours. Sickness is not ours. Issues are not ours. We cast them to you. And Lord, we command them to be broken. We command them. We decree the truth and it'll happen for us. And we decree over them free indeed. We decree over them you are the healed of the Lord. Father, release healing in the name of Yeshua. We say this garden's going to grow. And we thank you, God, for it. Be healed. Be free. Thank you, Father. God, I speak protection over them. I'm sorry, Lord. I thank you for protection that's already over them. I speak to the protection seed that's already on the inside of their heart. I speak to the seed of peace that is going to overcome their anxiety. God, they feel like that the anxiety, God, I thought I was done, but Lord, I just speak to that person right there, Lord, that is that is that is letting the seed of the enemy release anxiety into their mind and their heart and it's like a it's like an, a, an unrighteous leaven that's trying to take over their heart God but I speak against that seed and I speak to the peace on the inside of them and I say the seed of peace is a righteous leaven of kingdom thinking that has an even greater ability to take over every area of your heart and your mind so father I thank you for that coming into alignment I speak to the seed of peace on the inside of them. And I thank you, God, for protection. I thank you, God, that even if weapons are formed against us this week, we are not going to empower those weapons. We have empowered the words of God in our life, and they will be, root, they will be rooted in us, and they will be fruitful out of our heart. And we thank you that those weapons won't be allowed to prosper because we conditioned the soil of our heart to let the manifestation of that revelation take place. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. To God be the glory. Amen. Hey, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and, uh, and, and being a part. And, and we, we're excited about some things that are uh, here now and coming and have already happened. We're excited about all of it. Blessings to you. We love you. Be blessed.